Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AB English, and we turn in our study now of Dante's Inferno to canto number one, Dante meets Virgil, I'll title this canto, and each one of the cantos I'll try and maybe give you a little working title, um, our, our uh, poet uh, Robert Pinsky does not give a title to each canto, but I'll give you one just to maybe as a place marker, and in this one we're going to meet Dante, and we're going to meet Dante meeting Virgil, all right? Now, if you haven't been following my stuff at LearnStrong.net, definitely recommend you find the AP folder. I am working off the assumption that you have done that work with me up and through St. Augustine's Confessions. For sure, I'm hoping that you followed my lectures on the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, especially the, the lectures on the Aeneid. They're hypercritical to your reading of Dante. Um, as well, I've given an introductory lecture to Inferno. I hope that you have as well seen so that you're ready to move on. Now, again, the hope here for us is that you read first, and then you read and study along with me. Um, our learning theory, again, to remind you, is that capacity to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. And we will, uh, of course, do that in our annotative approach by asking three guiding questions. At level one, what does the text say? Summary. At level two, what does the text mean? Two A themes, messages. To be here, we're going to be concentrating primarily, as we did with our other epic studies, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, on symbolism and irony. We'll also be asking about Dante as poet, as politician, and as philosopher. So we'll spend a bit of time thinking about that. At level three, we ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way at 3A? Relating it, of course, to the material we've already studied, especially the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, and of course other texts you know. And then finally we'll ask, can I, can I somehow relate to this information personally? As I try to end our intro conversation, introduction to Inferno, if you can't make this stuff somehow relevant to you, then I'm, I'm wondering if it's even worth your time to mess with it. Does that make sense? So trying to connect to it in some meaningful way is important. Now, um, let's turn to a brief summary of Canto I before we read it together. T.S. Eliot, the great poet who we will finish our AP study with in his uh, great uh, classic, The Wasteland, as well as The Four Quartets, uh, said about Dante, as we've already said, you know, the importance of Dante, this, basically the world of literature is divided between uh, Dante and Shakespeare. But he said about Dante that what makes him so great, and I think this is uh, worth your writing in your notes, and let's look at at least the Inferno. I hope that you can read uh, Purgatorio or Paradiso on your own to see what he's, what he's meaning when he says that Dante is the most individual of poets and at the same time the most universal of poets. It's, it's, it's a remarkable thing to say about a poet. He's so specific to his time and to his place and he's so universal as well. We're going to see this evidenced right away when we get to the lines of poetry. By the way, I really do recommend what I recommended in our study with Fagel's translations of the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. Terrific notes are in the back end of this book for you. Almost always today when you purchase any kind of translation of Inferno and the Divine Comedia, you're going to have lots and lots of notes because, again, Dante is such a specific kind of, of poet to his time and place. So all kinds of people end up in the Inferno. There's no, a lot of times we don't have any clue exactly what's, what's happening. Finally, let's say this, and we need to hear this, I think, out loud. I didn't say this in my intro lecture, but I will say it now. I inferred to it, I just didn't say it. Let's say it now. Dante is the great pill for humbling us, right? Like reading Milton's Paradise Lost that we will speak about later, this is a poem that will for sure humble us. It humbles scholars who pick it up today. We're only going to be able to work at the epidermal level, as I have often said to you. And with that in mind still, let's enjoy as much as we can of each of these cantos. All right, let's do a, a brief summary of Canto 1, and then we'll read it. We're told he's at the age of 35. Well, technically, he doesn't say this, but we're going to know this because of our research. Uh, age 35, he, it's September the 7th, the year 1300, Good Friday. That's significant for your notes. And he finds himself lost in a wood. He sees a mountain. He tries to climb the mountain. On his way up the mountain, he's met by three uh, different animals that trouble him. A leopard, a lion, a she-wolf. And it freaks him out, so he turns around and he runs back down the mountain where he runs into Virgil. Uh, Virgil will say, uh, I am here, I will be your guide. 
And Virgil makes a couple of interesting prophecies, and ultimately he tells Dante, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you hell and then purgatory and heaven. And at the conclusion of our journey together, you're going to know some things you didn't know before. Let's go. And uh, Dante the Pilgrim will say, I'm ready to go on my trip. So that's kind of a brief overview of the very first canto. Now, let's go to the lines and read them, and as we read, we will exegete, or that is to say, we will annotate. So here we go. Midway on our life's journey, and this midway, by the way, is why we get to 35 years old, because Psalm 90 verse 10 suggests that a, uh, a normal span of life is 70 years, so halfway is 35 years, and again, we are in the year 1300. Midway on our life's journey, he says, I found myself in dark woods. Notice it's our life's journey, but he says, I found myself. Our, universal, I, specific. So notice the game. I found myself in dark woods. The right road, lost. In other words, I found myself somehow lost. Now, of course, we can talk about this as a literal, you know, being lost, but we kind of quickly come to understand. Allegorically, we're speaking about, in other words, I lost my way. We, I mean, we even have a saying, like, I, right, I lost my way. Sometimes ball players will say, I lost my interest, I lost my way. So, uh, sometimes artists will say this, I was, I was doing something great and then I kind of lost the interest or whatever. I lost my way. To tell about those woods is hard, so tangled and rough. We think about the twists and turns of the Odyssey, don't we? And savage, that thinking of it now, I feel the old fear stirring. No, in other words, Think about the, the trajectory here. In other words, Dante says, I made it through this experience and now I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to write in the past tense. But even thinking about it causes, brings up all kinds of fears. The introduction of a certain kind of tone and mood already in this poem of kind of freaked out. He says, death, death is hardly more bitter. Of course, he's going to know a lot about death before he gets through this inferno. And yet, to treat the good I found there as well. I'll tell what I saw, though how I came to enter the, the, the woods. I cannot well say, being so full of sleep, whatever moment it was, I began to blunder. We would ex expect almost the word here to be slumber, off the true path. Of course, in other words, he says, I somehow got here, but I'm not exactly sure how I got here. Morally speaking, I think we can understand exactly what it is that, that Dante is saying. For some reason or another, I ended up kind of lost. and I wasn't actually sure how I got here. But all of a sudden, I kind of woke up. Some seniors will say this. That has resonances. All of a sudden, I start waking up. I start having these strange epiphanies like, oh, yeah, my life is passing me by and all of that. Line 10. But when I came to stop below a hill that marked one end in the valley, by the way, this hill will remind us of Psalm 24, 3, the hill of the Lord um, of the valley that had pierced my heart with terror. We're back to that terror word. I looked up toward the crest and saw its shoulders already mantled in rays of the bright light uh, uh, of that bright planet that shows to ever uh, that the road to everyone whatever our journey. Two observations here. Um, we're, we're working in a Ptolemaic uh, construction of the world, of the universe, where the earth is the center of the, of, of the universe and the sun is just one more planet going around it. And he says, I saw a hill and I saw the sun at the top of the hill. That's significant. Write that down. We're going to see light at the end of the Divine Comedy when finally Dante the Pilgrim makes his way to Paradiso Heaven. And he says, he was on a journey. So already we see this notion of the epic story being on the epic journey. Then he says, I could feel the terror begin to ease that churned in my heart's lake all through the night. His heart, in other words. As one still panting ashore from dangerous seas looks back at the deep he's escaped. Wow, that's interesting because we know that word picture. That's, Odysse that's, that's Odysseus, isn't it? Being trapped out in the ocean and then finally making it to the island of Phaeacians. Dante is being very particular here in making references, allusions, references to other texts, allusions here to Odysseus. Ulysses is the one classic epic hero that will be mentioned in all three parts of the poem. That is significant. Now, of course, he'll be mentioned as Ulysses and not Odysseus. Same guy, though, as we know, right? He says, as one panting, ashore from dangerous seas, looks back at the deep he's escaped, my thought returned, still fleeing, to regard that grim defile that never left any alive who stayed in it. After I had rested my weary body a while, we're going to get a lot of this resting thing happening, by the way, I started again across the wilderness, my left foot always lower on the hill. By the way, this left foot is usually understood to be kind of allegorical for the earthly desires, the right foot being the strong foot. My left foot always lower on the hill, and suddenly, notice he's creating some tension, a leopard. Near the place, the way grew steep. 
live, spotted, quick of foot, blocking the path. She stayed before my face, and more than once, she made me turn about to go back down. Now, it's pretty clear that we're going to have lots and lots of biblical references. And, if, and, and again, there's a reason why I put the Bible on our reading list in the summer for AP English. Uh, and, and here we're going to have. Now, this is the reference to uh, Jeremiah 5, 6. And without question, Dante's playing games here. What is it that, these, that, that all of this um, will symbolize? We'll get to it, but the first one is a leopard, usually understood as worldly desire, sometimes understood uh, or lust, sometimes understood even as Florence itself. He says, it was early morning still, the fair sun rising with the stars attending it, as when divine love set those beautiful lights into motion at creation's dawn, and the time of day and season combined to fill my heart with hope of that beast with festive skin, but not so much that the next sight wasn't fearful. And then he tells us about the lion that's about to show up. By the way, make a note. Our first simile, comparison using like or as here, as when divine love. Notice that divine and love are both capitalized. Our first mention of love in this poem. That will be significant because we're going to have all kinds of interesting references to love. Put that in your notes. We'll come back to it. The next animal that he sees is a lion uh, that came at him. By the way, there's going to be three animals, which some have reckoned makes sense because we got the three different parts of inferno, incontinence, lust, uh, undisciplined, uh, violence, and finally fraud. A lion came at me, his head high as he ran, roaring with hunger so the air appeared to tremble. Some have argued that this is the representative of ambition. Some have seen it as France. Some have seen it as pride. Roaring with hunger so the air appeared to tremble. Then, the third animal, a grim she-wolf. Some have seen this as avarice, covetousness, some have seen it as referencing or symbolizing the papacy. A grim she-wolf, whose leanness seemed to compress all the world's cravings that had made miserable such multitudes. She put such heaviness into my spirit, I lost hope, the second time that hope is used here. Hope of the crest, in other words, I realized I wasn't going to get up that mountain. Like someone eager to win, who tested by loss, surrenders to gloom, and weeps. So did that beast make me feel, as harrying toward me at a low, she forced me back toward where the sun is lost. Any time you've tried a project and you have failed, you know exactly what Dante is referencing here. I wanted to climb the hill, and I couldn't. I was turned back. While I was ruining myself back down to the deep, someone appeared, and this coming back down the hill will remind us of the opening lines of, of Plato's Republic. I went down to the Piraeus, of course. Someone appeared, one who seemed nearly to fade as though from long silence. In other words, it's almost as if Dante is suggesting we don't listen to a, to a Virgil anymore. And, and that's in 1300, of course. That's even more the case today, huh? I cried to his human shape in that great wasteland. And the word wasteland here is, is beautifully translated because it will remind us, of course, of T.S. Eliot's classic poem that we're working towards in April as we get towards April. April is the cruelest month, reading lilacs out of the deadland, mixing memory and desire during stirring dull roots with spring rain, the opening lines of T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. He says, back to the wasteland I go, and then all of a sudden he speaks to it, and he says, you got to speak to a ghost before it can speak to you. This, put this in your notes because we'll see this with Shakespeare's Hamlet as well. Living man or shade, have pity and help me, whichever you may be. In other words, I need help. Please give me help. No living man. Now the response. This will be Virgil, right? No living man, though once I was, he replied. My parents both were Mantuans from Lombardy, and I was born sub Julio. In other words, I was born uh, before Julius Caesar, right? He's born um, um, 70 BCE. Julius Caesar dies, of course, 44, the eyes of March 44 BCE. The later, the later in. I lived in good Augustus's Rome, in the day of the false gods who lied. Now this false god stuff we know about because of our study of St. Augustine in his city of God. In other words, it was the old pagan gods that took us down, Virgil will say, with the opportunity of hindsight, if you will. He says about himself, a poet, I hemmed Anchises, his noble son, who came from Troy, when superb Elium, in its pride, was burned. In other words, we're going back already to the Aeneid, and why is it that Troy fell? It wasn't because of Helen. It wasn't because the Greeks were smarter. It was because of pride. But you, Virgil will continue, why go back down to such misery? You're there. Why are you, you are up on the hill. Why are you coming back? Why not ascend the beautiful or the delightful mountain, source 
and principle that causes every joy. Now we're going to get happy a little bit later. Here's the word joy. In other words, you were up, you, I mean, you were halfway up the hill. Why didn't you just keep going? Why did you come back down? Which is a very interesting question. Why stop, in other words? And notice Dante the Pilgrim. He won't answer the question. Instead, he will say, Then you are Virgil? Line 61. Then you are Virgil? Are you the font that pours so overwhelmingly a river of human speech? In other words, you're the fountainhead of all amazing poetry. I answered, he says, shamefaced. The glory and light are yours that poets follow. May the love that made me search your book in patient study avail me, master. And this, of course, is a giveaway for us. Dante the poet spent a lot of time reading what? Virgil's Aeneid. So he knows Virgil very well, which is why I say you have to know Virgil's Aeneid to really be able to read this poem well. By the way, Dante will have spent a lot of time studying a lot of books. Like we said, uh, Augustine's Confessions comes to mind as well, right? He says, you are my guide and author whose verse teach, whose verses teach the graceful style whose model has done me honor. Um, Vito Nova comes to mind. In other words, he says, I tried to emulate in, in, in every way that I could um, you, Virgil. Notice he says that you, Virgil, taught us and, it, and continue to teach. We, we used that term propedeutic before, didn't we, right? See this beast driving me backward? Help me resist, for she makes all my veins and pulses shudder. Again, Dante, the pilgrim, saying, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm freaked out. A different path from this one would be best, Virgil will say, for you to find your way from this feral place. He answered, seeing how I wept. Now, this weeping, we got to write this down. You guys pointed this out already, that it seems like in almost all of the epics, especially the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, we have our heroes who cry. Achilles cries, um, Odysseus cries, Aeneas cries. Now we've got Dante the Pilgrim crying, the weeping, right? This beast, Virgil will continue, the cause of your complaint lets no one pass her way, but harries all to death. Her nature is so malign and vicious, she cannot appease her veracity, for feeding makes her hungrier. That's the nature of lust, right? The, the more you feed it, the more you want it. Many are the beasts she mates. There will be more until the hound comes who will give this creature a painful death. Now, the hound here is capitalized. All kinds of discussion about what it is that Dante's talking about. He had a friend whose name was Dog, and he lived between two towns that kind of have um, um, the, the word felt in them. There's some possibility that the hound here represents maybe the Catholic Church, who Dante will hope will finally mend its avaricious ways. He is going to speculate and lead Italy. All of that will be referenced. Not nourished by earthly fare, he says at line 80, he will be fed by wisdom, goodness, and love. Born between Feltro and Feltro, he will restore low Italy as Nicias fought to achieve, and Turnus, Aurelius, Camellia, the maiden. All of these, of course, we're familiar with, but do note, that he didn't, Dante, intentionally. He didn't put Nicias and Aurelius, the two pals who die in the Aeneid together. And of course, Turnus and Camellia as well are the two great warriors that ultimately Aeneas has to defeat. Think about this. All four of these are, however, martyrs. They die for a cause, right? All dead from wounds in war. He will remove this lean wolf, hunting her through every region, till he has thrust her back to hell's abyss, where envy first dispatched her on her mission. Therefore, I judge it best that you should choose to follow me, and I will be your guide away from here and through an eternal place. Now, this is, again, the introduction to all of the divine comedy. And now we're going to get kind of a little gloss on where it is that Dante will be led as the pilgrim by Virgil, right? Notice, he says, first to hear the cries of despair and to behold ancient tormented spirits as they lament in chorus the second death revelation 2014 the second death they must abide hell in other words inferno then you shall see those souls who are content to dwell in fire because they hope someday to join the blessed toward whom if your ascent continues your guide will be one worthier than i in other words he says the second group of people we're going to see are those in purgatory. Now, hell is mentioned, of course, in the New Testament, as is, as is uh, heaven. But purgatory, not really. It's an invention, of course, 
but it's an interesting invention. And when we study all of the Divine Comedy, we're going to see that you have pain and suffering in purgatory. But what's different about it is, if you're in purgatory, you know you're going to heaven. It's just a matter of time. You have to purge. That's where the word purgatory comes from, right? You have to purge off those sins. And so he says, well, we're, we're going we're to head in that direction. However, he gestures, there will come a point where I can't lead you anymore. He says, when I have to leave you, you will be with her. Of course, here we're talking about Beatrice, that famous young girl that, um, that Dante saw and was so fixated on. For the emperor, God, who governs from on high, wills I not enter his city where none may appear who live like me in rebellion to his law. In other words, Virgil was unbaptized, right? Because he, he lived before the opportunity of baptism into a Christian burial, uh, baptism. His empire, God, is everything and everywhere. But that is his kingdom, his city, his seat of all. And then Virgil finishes, happy is the soul who chooses for that place. You want to write this down. The word choice is mentioned right here. This, by the way, will tie very closely to our study of Milton's Paradise Lost. The argument philosophically, theologically, the argument that Dante will make is the argument that St. Augustine makes, the argument that Thomas Aquinas makes, and that is this. You have the right to choose to do something really bad. You also have the right to be punished for that in hell or purgatory. Right? Choose. Help me escape this evil that I face, Dante the Pilgrim will say. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll skip, I missed a line, I'll skip up. He says, I, poet, please, by the God you did not know. Help me escape this evil that I face. And worse, lead me to witness what you have said. St. Peter's gate and the multitude of woes. Notice he inverts, he inverts. He's going to have to go through the multitude of woes to get to St. Peter's gate. Then we're told he set out and I followed where he led. Uh, notice that we will then have the goal as it's outlined for what, what it is that will happen in our poem. Reminding you, when I say poem, I don't mean Inferno often. I mean the entire Divine Comedy. We are, of course, reading, particularly studying Inferno. But as we work, I'm going to remind you.